Before we get into the session, we would like to go over the different language options that are available for this meeting and how you can participate. We will then introduce ourselves, the charge of the task force, the specific topic of today's listening session, and then turn it over to you to get your feedback. Uh, would the Vietnamese interpreter please introduce themselves? My name is Linh Nguyen, Vietnamese interpreter. Tên tôi là Linh thông dịch viên. Tôi sẽ thông dịch từ tiếng Anh qua tiếng Việt và từ tiếng Việt qua tiếng Anh. Chào mừng các quý vị đã dành thời giờ để tham gia vào chương trình này qua dạng dịch tiếng tiếp và có đề tài là huấn luyện sự thành kiến thầm kính. Nếu muốn phát biểu phản ứng của mình, à, quý, xin quý vị bấm vào nút có ba chữ trắng nhỏ, rồi bấm vào chữ à, giơ tay lên, chờ diễn giả kêu tên thì quý vị mới nói được lời phản ứng của mình. Cảm ơn nhiều. À, thank you. Introduce themselves. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Gabriela Herrera, soy una de las eh, intérpretes de español. Si necesitan interpretación al español para este evento, por favor llamen al 1617-675-4444 y el código de acceso 728-297-5327. Uno ocho cinco cuatro seguido por el signo de número. Voy a repetir rápidamente: llamar al seis uno siete seis setenta y cinco cuatro 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 con código código de acceso siete veintiocho dos nueve siete cinco siete tres dieciocho cincuenta y cuatro y signo de gato. Muchas gracias y por favor apaguen el volumen para este evento. Es muy importante. Thank you. Would the Haitian Creole interpreter please introduce themselves? Hi, right, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Samuel Malis. I'll be the Haitian Creole interpreter. Not the boss of the Mkila, no, I'm Samuel Milus. C'est moi qui avais été prêt à créole haïtien. Ou besoin de vous dire créole haïtien. Et t'en voulu mon événement principal ça. Et puis composer le numéro ça. Hi, my name is Mary Laduser. I'm going to be your Haitian Creole interpreter. Ou besoin, non, pas c'est Mary Laduser. C'est moi qui vais interpréter pour un créole. Ou besoin inter audio créole haïtien et un volume ou non événement principal ça relé na 1 617 675 44 44 1 617 675 44 44 code d'accès à 453 179 25 99 211 453 179 259 92 Thank you. Would the uh, Mandarin interpreter please introduce themselves? Hi, uh, my name is Terry. Uh, me and Wang will be your Mandarin Chinese interpreter. Uh, Nihao,如果你们需要国语翻译的话,可以拨打这个电话,1617-675-4444,然后加入密码是1853620-5224,加井号,谢谢。Thank you. Would the Cantonese interpreter please introduce themselves? Would the Cape Verdean Creole interpreter please introduce themselves? Hi, good Hi. afternoon. My name is oh. Rochelle and I'll be your Cape Verdean interpreter. Boa tarde, Kelly e Rochelle, and to ser nossa intérprete Cabo Verdeana. Si mesti audio na Creole Cabo Verdeano, então chama pa. 617-675-4444, código de excesso é 548-211-1097-33, depois calca no botão asterístico, no lado direito, no teclado numérico. Então, desliga o som, por favor, na ex-evento principal. Obrigado. Thank you. Would, would the Cantonese interpreter please introduce themselves? Hi, good afternoon. Melissa and Anna will be providing Cantonese interpretation for you for this meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you. Live captioning will be streamed simultaneously as a split screen to this session. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see a window to view the multimedia player, which will show the live captioning. Please click continue to view the live captioning. The ASL stream of this meeting can be accessed via Zoom platform. The meeting ID number is 964-5353-6839, and the passcode is 151195. The WebEx meeting will be screen shared in the Zoom plat platform with no audio. Everyone joining this event as an attendee will have their microphone muted and you will not have the ability to turn your camera on. If you are joining on a computer device at the bottom of your screen, you have a menu that has different icons. The microphone will be grayed out since you are muted as an attendee. If you can't hear, please click the phone icon and check to make sure your audio connection is set to speaker and microphone. When your name is called to testify, please raise your hand by clicking the more icon, which is illustrated by three dots, then click the raised hand icon. Once your testimony is done, please click the same icon to lower your hand. If you are joining by phone, please press star three to raise your hand. You will hear two beeps when you are taken off mute. At that point, you can begin your testimony. Please keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and testimony will be shared with the task force. We encourage you to continue submitting written comments via the Google form on the boston.gov site. Additionally, for those of you that have questions that you present today, please do so in the chat. Those questions will be posted and also answered on the task force website. Uh, this was an issue for attendees yesterday. I know that was covered, but the purpose of today is not for uh, primarily not for us to uh, answer questions about the task force itself or our individual perspectives. We want to open this up and get your input on implicit bias and implicit bias training, which is the topic for today. Everyone joining this, or I'm sorry, to ensure that all opinions are heard and respected, uh, we want to lay out the decorum for today's listening sessions. We ask that you engage respectfully at all times. Disruptive per, uh, behavior will not be permissible. Priority for spoke, spoken testimony will go to those who signed up 24 hours in advance via the bpd.google form. After everyone who signed up in advance has provided their spoken testimony, the public listening session will be open for comments for as long as time permits. The hosts will unmute attendees who raise their hand to speak on a first come basis. Please note, we want to try to give everyone an opportunity to speak today who intends to do so. So we will try to limit uh, the number or, or strike that we will try to prioritize those who have not had an opportunity to speak. So please, before raising your hand, think about what testimony you want to provide, get your points down, and then use that time productively to express your opinion and perspective on the, ta on the issue uh, that is the focus of today. We'd like to avoid continuing to call on the same people so that we can make sure that everyone gets the opportunity to be heard. Spoken testimony will be limited to two minutes per person at the discretion of the task force to allow as many people possible to share their thoughts. We encourage you to submit additional written testimony via the, uh, the BPD form. Please be mindful of the pace of your spoken testimony so that it's clear to the interpreters. And again, these listening sessions will be recorded and transcripts will be made available to the task force. Uh, before we get into the topic at issue today, I'd like to just do a brief introduction of what the task force uh, is and how it came about, and then introduce the task force uh, members who are present and participating. On June 12th, Mayor Walsh signed on to the Mayor's Pledge from the Obama Foundation MP MBK Alliance. As part of this pledge, to turn commitments to reform into action, the mayor convened the Boston Police Task Force and charged it with reviewing, improving the body camera program, recommending rigorous implicit bias training for officers, reviewing Boston police use of force policies, and strengthening the existing co-op board. As part of the review, the task force will engage the community and listen to a broad range of input, expertise, and experience and then present recommendations to the mayor within 60 days. 
introducing the uh, task force members who uh, are present today. Uh, I, uh, am, my name is Javier Flores, as I stated before. I'm an attorney here in Boston at Dinsmore and Shoal. I'm also a, a, a Boston resident and a member, a member of the uh, Boston Office for Fair Housing and Equity. Um, also present is Marie St. LaFleur, who is a former Mass State Representative. Tanisha Sullivan, who is the president of the NAACP Boston branch. Allison Cartwright, who is attorney in charge of the Roxbury Public Defender's Office. Eddie Crispin, who is the uh, member of the Boston Police Department and the president of MAMLEO, MAMLEO. Uh, Jamal Crawford, who is a, a Boston resident and a longtime advocate for police reform. And our chair, uh, Wayne Budd, who is the former U.S. Attorney for the District of Massachusetts. Before we begin to take testimony from the attendees today, I uh, would like to do just a quick introduction into implicit bias and the importance of the subject and some of the things that we're considering. Uh, implicit bias is the idea that you are influenced in your behavior and decision making by elements in your environment, such as race, gender, and ethnicity, even though you are focused on other things and believed yourself to be making an, an unbiased assessment. Uh, Im implicit bias is a behavioral phenomenon that has been scientifically proven. Uh, even in the absence of bigotry, people hold implicit biases based upon their own experience and perceptions. And while, uh, and those biases can impact our decision-making uh, and, and the way that we interact with people. While the focus uh, of considerations of implicit bias typically uh, are on race, uh, other biases can also manifest. Those biases would include uh, gender, religion, age, sexual orientation, just to name a few. Uh, understandably, from a policing standpoint, implicit bias can have a significant impact upon uh, communities. Uh, through implicit bias can, can affect things such as, um, you know, certain demographics being subjected to a larger number of, of stop and frisks or getting pulled over on a more frequent basis. It can also impact the length uh, of any police interaction with members of the community. Uh, it can impact kind of the tenor and the nature of those interactions. Are they pleasant? Are they unpleasant? Uh, it can impact the number of arrests that certain demographics are subjected to. And of course, it can impact uh, the use of force or the perception of threat that a certain individual uh, or group of individuals might pose. So naturally, reducing implicit bias uh, in the way that police officers interact with the community is essential to preventing injustice and to building trust between uh, the police and minority communities. Now, the reason that it's uh, a primary focus of the task force is that there is evidence to suggest that implicit bias has an impact upon policing here in Boston. For instance, uh, the African-American community in Boston makes up 23.1% of the population but statistics suggest that from 2017 to 2019, they comprised 47% of the arrests. So they were be, are being arrested at a rate that is nearly double the percentage of the population. Uh, alternatively, uh, you know, white uh, members of the Boston community comprise 43.9% of the population, but only 27.6% of the arrests. Additionally, uh, what's known as field interrogations and observations, which are essentially uh, instances in which members of the, or known as FIOs, which are instances in which the BPD uh, interacts with community members via stop and frisk. Um, the statistics published by the BPD showed that 70% uh, of FIOs involved uh, African-American community members which, uh, you know, based upon the, the demographics, uh, suggests that they are disproportionately being subjected to stop and frisk. 
Now, BPD has a bias-free policing policy. Uh, that, that policy says that, you know, uh, BPD officers shall not consider race, ethnicity, gender, national origin, et cetera, uh, when there is credible intelligence, unless there is credible intelligence that links a person with those characteristics to a specific crime, accident, um, or, or pattern of behavior. Um, additionally, the, the BPD policy suggests that police officers' decisions uh, must be based upon fact uh, and that, and, you know, cannot be based upon an individual's demographics uh, or, or any specific characteristics uh, that are different from the majority in the area where the individual is found. Now, unfortunately, you know, the issue with implicit bias is, of course, that uh, in theory, the individual, well, separating implicit bias from, from express bigotry, uh, the issue with implicit bias is that the individual often doesn't know that their, that their decisions are being uh, impacted by their own personal prejudices, which is why, you know, for, for years, uh, corporations across the country have engaged in implicit, implicit bias training, uh, you know, in the aftermath of, uh, you know, uh, the, the, well, in, in the last five years, I should say, uh, which was specifically triggered by the, the, the killing of Michael Brown by police in Ferguson. Uh, police departments around the country have increasingly focused upon implicit bias training. Uh, a recent CBS survey showed that 69% of police departments across the country uh, engage in implicit bias training. 57% of those uh, initiated that training uh, during the last five years. Now, implicit bias training tries to focus on helping people to identify and understand and recognize their own prejudice and to suggest behaviors and strategies that will prevent those prejudices from impacting their, their actions or decisions. Uh, unfortunately, you know, after five years of, of training, it, it's difficult to evaluate what effect, if any, implicit bias is training is having. Uh, both in in terms of uh, in police forces and then in, in the community as a whole. Uh, in order to evaluate the effectiveness of implicit bias training, there'd have to be targeted data uh, that that unfortunately simply is not unavailable. Uh, but you know, studies uh, across the country have shown that throughout all industries, implicit bias training uh, has not had a sufficient impact, if any. So I guess the, the question that's posed to this task force, um, you know, where, where BPD provides implicit bias training, but the question that's posed to this task force is what changes need to be implemented in order to reduce the impact of implicit bias in the interactions of the BPD with, with our community members. And so, you know, there's a number of, of, of possibilities uh, for how that can be achieved. Um, one could be revamping the implicit bias training that's uh, that that's currently being offered, uh, you know, either on in, a, in the academy uh, or to uh, police officers, tenured police officers. Another option is to either introduce uh, or use as an alternative anti-racist training. Uh, anti-racist training is is a more direct and uh, you know has recently become a, a more uh, you know, it's kind of the, the more recent trend is to go towards anti-racist training as, as a mechanism for stopping people for, or stopping police officers or, or community members at large uh, from engaging in bigoted behavior. Uh, the other considerations are, you know, increasing the amount of academy training that's offering that's offered, increase the amount of training that's offered to tenured police officers, and then, you know, focusing on increasing diversity and inclusion within the BPD and ensuring that officers of color are in districts with significant minority populations um, so be, uh, to help reduce the impact of, uh, of implicit bias. So, uh, you know, having provided that intro, um, you know, I, I want to offer an opportunity for some of the other task force members to provide their thoughts or identify uh, any issues that I may have missed. So, I want to say thank you, Javier, for that very comprehensive um, Introduction. 
I, I want to thank the participants who are waiting um, to offer their recommendations and suggestions to us um, and simply say, my name is Marie St. Floor. I'm a former state rep and I'm a resident of Dorchester. Um, that's who's speaking. I just break it down to leave you with this as you're pulling your thoughts together that, you know, unconscious or implicit bias coupled with our country's history of systemic racism leads to disparate impact on communities of color, particularly black people. And that has been demonstrated by the data. So what we're looking for, I hope that we will hear from you this afternoon through your recommendations. I know Javier offered a number of um, suggestions because that's all they were, um, was that we hear more suggestions from you about um, ways that we can impact the system um, to, to bring systemic changes um, that we can implement that would be transparent, that would uphold transparency and uphold accountability in order to reduce um, this type of disparate treatment. So thank you for being there being here and we look forward um, to your comments. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, are there any other task force members that would like to address this issue before we open it up for testimony? Uh, if, if Eddie Crispin is on, Eddie, do you wanna introduce yourself and, and talk a little bit about uh, the type of training that's, that's currently being provided on uh, in the Academy? Yes, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Eddie Crispin, a 20 year member of the Boston Police Department, lifelong resident of the city of Boston and president of the Massachusetts Association of Minority Law Enforcement Officers. Uh, I think we do have some training at the academy having worked there. But again, um, my concern has always been um, how effective uh, a few hours of training can be. So I think it's important to hear from people. And I think uh, my other concern is that oftentimes the display of um, of um, bias can be so subtle that we don't see it. So I think it's important that we really figure out a way to um, make officers aware of their biases and limit how it comes into play during the course of uh, of their interactions with the uh, with with the civilian population. Thank you, Eddie. So at this point, you know we want to give an opportunity for people to provide, you know, their thoughts on implicit bias, their thoughts on implicit bias training or, or any other type of training that they, they feel may be an effective mechanism for reducing, uh, you know, the impact of, of implicit biases or bigotry uh, upon our community um, or, or, you know, to provide their thoughts and other considerations relative to this issue that uh, we might be missing. Um, Please use the uh, you know raise your hand function uh, if if you do have something to offer on this issue. Right. And I want to remind everyone as well that we want to try to to limit everyone's opportunity to speak to uh, you know to one so that everyone gets an opportunity to participate. So please, you know, consider the issues that you want to present and try to present them in, in, a, in a concise manner. So, you know, in the absence of anyone raising their hand, um, you know, what, you know, Marie and Eddie, I think perhaps, you know, we, we can discuss the things that we've been looking at, um, you know, implicit bias training, uh, Anti-racist training. Uh, these are, are t these are industries. Uh, you know, there are experts around the country who have uh, dedicated themselves to both uh, studying the, the presentation uh, of such training and to, to combating uh, implicit biases in people's behavior. Um, you know, we have undertaken a study. Uh, to see what other police departments uh, are doing to provide implicit bias training. Uh, we, we've tried to identify who are the experts around the country who have been, uh, you know, effective in providing trainings to uh, reduce the impact of implicit biases and, and what are, what was the data that has been used to measure those successes. Um, you know, so through that process, um, you know, we've identified experts uh, specifically 
uh, you know, an individual who in uh, addressed the Oakland PD, uh, Jennifer Eberhardt, who's uh, a, you know, a former uh, uh, Boston resident, I believe, who now lives out in California. And what Ms. Eberhardt did was she, she talked to officers about ensuring that before they initiate an FIO, um, before they, you know, pull someone over, before they engage in a stop and frisk, make sure that your reasons for in initiating that interaction with community member uh, are based upon objective data. Uh, they're based upon, you know, real uh, evidence that that individual may have engaged in, in unlawful behavior or may have been a participant in a, in a crime, as opposed to, uh, you know, initiating based upon a, a feeling or a belief uh, as, as those types of instincts are often guided by bigotry and bias. Uh, Eddie or Marie, do, do you want to talk about any of the other considerations that we've looked at? Yeah, I think for me, when I talk to uh, officers who are out there actively patrolling, I think the issue is that most of them do not feel like they have any biases or they're not any outright. There are those who may realize they have them. I think the question, the issue with implicit bias is that for most people, it's not something that they're consciously aware of. Um, it, the issue is making people aware of what their biases are, at least having a conversation and teaching them and having them take a hard look at how they behave and how they interact with people and how to minimize or negate that from the interactions they have with the public. I think based on some of the research I've read, it seems to be that training is the best way, um, training people how to, to recognize those biases and how to not let them come into play um, when they're interacting with the public. So again, I, I think for me, it's, it's really about training. The more, the more that we, the more training that officers receive and the more we make them aware of what their biases are, the less likely they are to allow them to come into play. I, I, I want to say, um, I, I, I want to encourage, we have over 40 people online, and this is an opportunity for uh, us to hear from you, um, to, to hear your testimony, your experiences, your recommendations, and your suggestions. And so I'm going to encourage you um, to please um, use, use the opportunity, um, because we want to be able to get this qualitative data, that testimony from you in order to influence the, um, the, the, the decisions that we make. It's really critical. So I'm going to be quiet and really um, look um, for your words. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Thanks, Fleur. I just want to call on Cassie Quinlan, who had signed up in advance to testify. Thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. OK, good. Um, I don't know if you have my written piece. I ha started it off with a little story, which maybe that's a good way to say. Um, basically, because um, I know I guess I'm a little familiar with the white side the, and with the Irish side of bias. And one of the one of the features of that piece, and one and sometimes you can have you know good Irish trainers, and we need to have more because. There's a value of few words. There's also a value of no complaining. There's also a value of silence and just do your job and don't complain. And it kind of sometimes can lead to a lack of conversation um, and kind of an assumption that everybody else does things the same way. Um, I will read a small little piece because bias doesn't show up always in what people say, um, as uh, Officer Kristen said. Um, as a school bus driver in Boston from 1976 to 1984, I sometimes drove field trips. One, one of those trips, I drove on one of two buses on a trip to a black church to, um, in Boston to an amusement park in Rhode Island. Um, I'd have been driving a school bus in Boston. It took me a while to get used to the black kids. I drove the st their style of speaking, my style of speaking. I told them to line up in single file. You know, they thought I sounded like a nun from Montreal, which I, that's where, where I learned how to speak. They thought it was very funny. It took a while for me to get used to those kids and learn that I could ask them to quiet down and tell them I can't hear, you know, tell them what's going on with me as opposed to just insist. In any case, because I'd learned to work with these kids and I'd come to enjoy them, um, you know, and, and I drove from Roxbury and Mattapan to Charlestown and everything, I also enjoyed driving the families on a field trip. 
As each person boarded my bus, I greeted each one informally, offered to hold any supplies if that would make it easier for them to climb, or keep the children in tow. I chatted with some, and finally, when all were seated, I made an announcement to the whole bus to say, okay, I've placed two bags, two trash bags on the bus to hold trash, one at the front and one at the rear. So I asked them to use those, and then I encouraged everybody to enjoy the trip. And, um, you know, we just drove on, and it was about an hour away. And when people got off, they thanked me, and I was, again, alert to help in any way, um, passing them any items that they might need in the process, said goodbye. At the park, I closed up my bus and went to check with the other driver, a middle-aged white man, who had transported the other half of the group from the exact same church. I had my mouth open to say, wasn't that a nice group? But I stopped when I heard him. He said, animals, look at this. And sure enough, his bus was trashed. It was a total mess. Clearly, our attitudes were the exact opposite. Instead of developing a collaborative relationship with the group, as I did, his manner was gruff, silent, aloof. Maybe he was anticipating trouble at the outset. His attitude was clear to those who rode on the bus, who kind of, they were either careless or resentful, and they rebelled. His bus was trashed and mine was spotless. Ms. Quinlan, can you j please just speak a little slower so the interpreter uh, can translate? I sent it in writing. Do you have it? Yes, please continue. Just, just slightly slower to make it easier okay. for the interpreter. Okay, sure. All right. Anyway, I only tell those stories. I just... um. I found a couple of links also about concerns about dealing with guns and police in Chicago. And, um, you know, because sometimes the implicit bias training, one of the things that strikes me is, first of all, among people and in, in themselves, it's not implicit at all. It's perfectly explicit. Um, people, uh, one of the things of our, of our uh, white culture, whatever we believe, that we don't have to be close to people, but we can still judge them from however far away. And we're probably right because we don't understand how to get close enough um, or that it makes a difference if you get close to people. And so to have people doing, um, I don't know, a Harvard Review study said that implicit bias training often doesn't work. Um, as you were saying, also, I don't know how long I talk, but I do have a couple of things, but basically on that, that it's better to get people involved in, get the police involved in doing projects and roping and in, in being part of the solution, rather than trying to tell people you should do this, you shouldn't think that, and here's how the brain works. Um, uh, you know, these people, anyway, it's, it's a very, I have things to say and how to sort out how to say them, um, but it really matters. Oh, that's what they said in Chicago that, um, you know, they said, well, what, well one, one fellow um, on the show, and I have links to, I can send to people about this inter interviews with people about Chicago and a whole black masters people speaking was fabulous. Um, one of them saying, look, these gangs, they should be outlawed. We should take care of them or whatever. And the other guy saying, well, look, you should realize that, you know, the history of Chicago and the police, um, the police, basically, they had so many prejudices. I guess that's the point of the implicit white bias or the Irish bias, you know, the non-spoken bias, that we can tell when people are thugs. We can tell when people are lazy. Uh, you know, we can assume that. Um, without understanding that we see a piece of the problem, and if we get a little closer, we can learn more of the problem. How's that for now? Thank you, Ms. Quinlan. I, I appreciate your testimony, um, and I, I think you made a, a fantastic point, which is that um, you know interaction uh, outside of, of policing between BP, BPD members and, and the community is a fantastic way to build relationships and to uh, reduce prejudices and. and, and Bigotries, whether explicit or implicit. Um, Jamal, do, do you uh, do you want to uh, join in? Well, I just want to say this. Here's what here's what's helpful for me, at least. Speaking completely for myself as an individual, Jamal Crawford, not speaking as a representative of of, of the task force as a body. What I, uh, as an activist and an advocate, going through these things for years, what people need to do is fire off their darts very succinctly. And, and hit it and quit it. We cannot take this much time on, on, on specific individuals every time. So I need people to really try, strive as much as you can to get it down into a nugget. And anything that you cannot get into that nugget, once again, if you submitted it via uh, writing or what have you, if you have a whole bunch to say, maybe that's, that's the best way to do it. But we have to move. We have to move. We cannot do anecdotal. We have to do testimonial. That's my comment. Thanks, Jamal. I just want to make sure uh, that Claire Barker 
uh, who had an observation gets a chance to speak. Okay, Claire. Claire, you're unmuted. Um, thank you. And I didn't. Um, my observation is based on yesterday's testimony that you took about um, body worn cameras. Is that full time automatic use, automatic on use of body worn cameras is essential to anti racist policing and addressing implicit biases that we all hold. We're all born with them or trained to have them. I'm thinking that footage from police citizen interactions, all kinds of interactions can be used to help officers and citizens alike learn how their biases play out on the street. Thanks, Claire. Uh, I agree uh, 100%. You know, all the different elements that we're looking at uh, as a task force, they all interrelate uh, and, and they all are aimed at the, the same, you know, overall objective, which is to, you know, to uh, the promotion of justice and uh, decreasing the, the impact of racism and bigotry uh, upon, uh, you know, our, our community and, uh, you know, to, to have a, a, a more uh, equitable and, and a, a better relationship between the BPD and, and community members. And you know, the, there's all these things have to go hand in hand, and we have to make improvements in a number of different areas in order to achieve our, achieve our objectives. And uh, to your point, uh, there was a study recently that uh, focused upon uh, implicit bias by reviewing body worn cameras and uh, examining the nature of the interactions between BPD officers, or not BPD officers, but officers in general, this wasn't done in Boston, and, uh, you know, members of the community to see whether or not the way that officers addressed different different demographics uh, were, were the same or different. And, you know, what they found was that when, when officers were interacting with, uh, you know, people of color, with minorities, they often had a, a much more uh, aggressive and uh, you know, uh, you know, just poor nature of interaction uh, than they did with white members of the community. So uh, you know, by by you know focusing on the body worn cameras, that's certainly a, a necessity in terms of ensuring that implicit biases or, or explicit biases don't leak into uh, into policing. Phase, uh, other any other hands raised? We don't see any additional raised hands. Okay. So, um, you know, I want to open it up to any other members of the task force if they feel like there's anything important to address uh, related to this issue. I just want to reiterate that this is a listening session. So please, I know there are well now well over 60 of you on this line. So I'm going to be quiet. And honestly, just to hear from you, what are, what 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 do you have that w to share with us so that we can um, that would inform us? It's really about listening to you, um, not listening to us. So please um, engage. Um, look, we're going to just be quiet and just um, wait for you um, to join us. And Fasia will probably just if we could just have somebody call the list. It would be great to hear from everyone today. Thank you. Yeah, Marie is absolutely correct. You know, the purpose of this is to allow the community the opportunity to to help provide guidance to the task force uh, and, and help shape the recommendations that will ultimately be made to the mayor. And in order to do that, it, it's important that that everyone here who's taking the time out of their day to to join this session, uh, you know, speak up and provide their input. Uh, you know, we need to hear from you and what your experiences are and. And, and try to use that to make sure that we're we're providing the the best possible recommendations. So Stephen Buckley, I think that's the only other person with their hand raised. Um, just one second. Hi, uh, Steve Buckley. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. 
I just want to point out that the uh, helpful notes that you have up on the screen right now are uh, incorrect as far as how to raise your hand. Maybe that's preventing some people from doing that. Uh, it's not the dot, dot, dot. I don't, when I pulled the, the dot, dot, dot uh, icon button down at the bottom, I don't see any raised hand. Um, I, I, but I do go over to the participant icon, the button shows a little head, like a person's head. And that pulls up the participants on a panel. And then there's a little teeny weeny hand that you can click on. So maybe that's where people, I'm just saying what it, what it looks like on my screen. So just wanted to point that out. Um, For the feedback, Stephen, uh, I see that caller six, it also has their hand raised. So we will uh, move to them as well. Okay. And so anyway, the, uh, and it would be helpful with the, uh, as, uh, Mr. Crawford was saying about keeping remarks short. If there was something in here that would tell people whether they have one minute or two minutes or three minutes or unlimited, then they can... two minutes. You know, we'll we'll, we'll provide uh, some, some flexibility if it seems like you're you're wrapping up around the two minute. But but please try to keep your comments to two minutes if possible. Caller, you are unmuted. Hello. Hi. Please Hello. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay. I'm um, calling with my phone, so I'm not on the computer to be able to see if you're um, letting me know that I can speak. Is that correct? No, you're you're on right now. Uh, it's your turn to speak. Oh, okay. Please, please introduce okay, yourself. Great. Uh, my name is Tasha, and I'm calling the first uh, part of my question. I want to ask about uh, the police oath. Oh the oath that you guys take um, regarding to your badge. And I can't um, recite it, I don't know, maybe someone would do that for me, but I do know that at the end of it, uh, it says something about, so help me God. And, and I really wanna know, what is the purpose to have the police officers state that oath? And what does that mean at the end? And the reason why I'm asking that question, because I've had an uh, opportunity to speak with several many different law enforcement and I just want to know is that something that is encouraged within the law enforcement community that they have a relationship with God and Christ because it, it often shows up when you're uh, interacting with them those who have uh, a different type of presence it, it's a confidence and it's not based out of fear and they know how to deal with the public without escalating a situation versus um, a different type officer who is already uh, a showing up aggressive in, in a strifely manner. So my question is, is it something that's encouraged within the law enforcement community to uh, actually uh, mm -hmm. take the end part of that oath seriously to have that as a part of their life? Because everybody is guided by a spirit, a good spirit, and an evil spirit, it, it's almost as if it kind of shows when you interact with them. Like I said, I've had an opportunity to speak with a lot of different officers and they have a confidence, but it's a, the right kind, not the type of confidence that's brutal. Thank you, Tasha. Uh, we, we do, I wanna remind you, we do wanna keep focused on, on issues of implicit bias and implicit bias training. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate you know, your testimony, your question, uh, your participation in this session, but, um, you know, the, the, the oath of officers is, is a bit outside the purview uh, of what we're trying to look at today. Um, you know, the, I myself am not an officer, so I, I don't feel that I can answer that question, um, but, um, you know, I, I, I do wanna try to keep it based, uh, you know, strictly focused upon uh, the subject matter. Aaron Davis is the next speaker. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, hi, thank you so much for the opportunity to join this discussion. It's a incredibly important topic. Um, thank obviously. You. Yeah, we really appreciate it. You know, a few things have struck me as I've been listening to you all and, and thinking of bias and implicit bias and racial justice and all of that sort of thing. One of the points I heard earlier was that, um, I'm not sure if it was Jamal, 
but I heard talking with officers, most don't feel they have bias. Well, none of us feel we have bias. It's, it, that's just a very human thing. We try to be open and all of that, but if we're human, we have biases because biases develop as a natural course of human decision making, right? You have to make quick decisions and you're hardwired to be able to do that. So I think that that's a very normal thing, whether it's police or other wise, but some of the questions or thoughts I had for the task force to think about are, uh, you know, what kind of training and how extensive is it in the academy? Because it is proven that training helps, but a two hour training and then walking away doesn't really alter anybody's behaviors really. So how much training is done? Is there a layered approach to it? Uh, is there follow up training for it? Is there police officer training versus leadership training. So uh, I do I do think that those are things to be thinking about if you're not already doing so. Um, and obviously it starts at the top, you know that. So it's good that Marty is pushing this, right? And you're all leading it. Um, so is there a way to understand what sort of training currently happens um, for the academy and then the follow up later? Uh, to that, and are you uh, taking into consideration the the newer concepts beyond implicit bias of uh, just racial equity and the use of privilege and power to get uh, white people more engaged in the conversation that it that they can be certainly a part of the racial discussions. There's a lot of good content out there about about that right now as well. So just something that questions and something to think about. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so uh, Eddie would would know best uh, based upon his experience about what what types of training are offered uh, in the academy. You know, we we have seen uh, and been provided by the BPD with uh, the training materials that are utilized, and um, you know, I think I think we agree that they can be improved upon, and and that's something that we will cer certainly focus on. And, and I agree with you that. You know, a, a two hour session, uh, you know, amidst uh, uh, for an academy attendee is not going to be sufficient to, to have, a, a, you know, a long term impact upon their behavior. Uh, Jake is next. Jake, you're unmuted. Jake. Jake Laidloff, your hand is raised and you're unmuted. Moving on to the next participant, Sophia Carlton. Can you hear me well? Yes. Uh, hi, I'm just giving a very quick testimony. Uh, my interactions with the Boston Police Department have been very limited, uh, but one interaction that struck my, you know, struck in my memory and has stayed with me. Uh, a few years ago, I was going with my husband in the car. He was driving. I was sitting on the passenger seat, and my husband went straight, coming from on a lane that was supposed to take a right turn only on Jamaicaway, and he was uh, pulled over by an officer who was uh, patrolling traffic there. And my husband was very cranky. He was moody and hungry. And when the officer approached us, he didn't necessarily, you know, have the kindest approach. So he, he was, you know, malicious or violent, but he just kind of responded a little bit scuffing. And the officer asked, do you know why I pulled you over? And he's like, no, why'd you pull me over? Kind of giving attitude. And I, as an immigrant coming to the United States about 10 years ago and seeing all of the news about, you know, abuse of force, I was terrified of us getting shot. Meanwhile, my husband, who is white and has had, you know, a couple other interactions with the police that have always been very peaceful, he was not the least bit worried. And I, we, we talked about, about the incidents, how has that seemed like a display of white privilege, uh, that if my husband was of a different color, perhaps I was of a different color, that interaction wouldn't have gone that way. So I think my hope is that the training that is being conducted and you know increased training helps extend that kind of treatment to everybody and understand that that day my husband wasn't judged for being cranky and giving a kind of you know rough response but other people are in with severe consequences um, so that was my uh, little testimony and 
hope that this can be extended to all citizens. Thank you, Sophia. We appreciate your thoughts. Um, and, and what you're describing is, is exactly the condition uh, that we're referring to, where your husband was afforded, um, you know, uh, a much different experience because of the implicit biases of the officer uh, than some others that have been under similar circumstances based upon, you know, race, ethnicity, gender. Uh, Hazel, do we have anyone else raising their hand? Ms. X, you will be uh, unmuted. So, uh, can you guys hear me well? Yes. Okay. So, I just want everybody to understand exactly what implicit bias is. Uh, not everybody is aware of really what implicit bias is. And um, I hear that the officers should be trained and you know, what exactly is it entails in a two hour training may or may not, you know, affect the officer, but I feel that the community as well would benefit from a implicit bias training because implicit bias occurs when someone consciously rejects a stereotype, but and then hold negative association in his or her mind unconsciously. So it's, we're not always aware um, and I know that was a reiterated and I'm not trying to be redundant here, but I feel that the community itself can benefit it because there's a lot of um, explicit bias towards the police officers and implicit biases. So with the police department being trained, I feel that the community will also benefit um, from learning what implicit bias really is and how to have concepts and uh, strategies in order to deal with it because when officers usually respond, they already are the bad guy in some cases, not in all, but you know, officers risk their lives to um, help other people that, and they do take a Hippocratic oath, uh, you know, such as um, healthcare professionals seek as well and educators. So again, when we are addressing these implicit biases, I think that, you know, it would benefit the community as well to have this kind of training so that, or even awareness so that they can see exactly what implicit bias entails and what exactly it is. Since it's an unconscious belief that most people don't even, you know, are, are aware that they have. Thank you. We will um, try to identify any community based implicit bias trainings that are available or education that's available and, and put it on the task force website if anyone's interested. Um, can I just remind people to please lower your hand after you've testified? Uh, those, you know, connecting uh, via a laptop, um, you, you have to click your hand again, and those on the phone have to hit star three after they're done to lower their hand. Um, Faisal, can we give Mr. Buckley indicated that he had uh, he wanted to provide testimony in additional uh, or additional to uh, identifying some of the potential technical issues? Can we circle back with him and give him an opportunity? Absolutely. We are going in the order of the raised hands, however, uh, and given folks who've testified already, we just want to make sure to go through that list, but absolutely. Chad Fletcher, you are next. Oh, very good. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. So uh, this was a question that I had raised in the chat because I wasn't too sure if I would get a turn. I sound had a lot of. It seems like a lot of other people have their hands up. Um, I now in each, in pretty much every job that I've applied for, as of late, you know, there's a series of behavioral questions that I have to answer, and these are all, and these are quite. These are not just behavioral questions, but also uh situational questions i mean what the employer is trying to see is how i would react whenever 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 a certain instant whenever something arises i mean it could be it could be whatever now i want i wanted to know i'm just wondering if you could tell me um are there any questions uh in the exam you know that that that's a part of an exam a potential police officer has to take um, that cover implicit bias, and if not, will we have an opportunity to, you know, us as as residents of Boston to 
uh, come up with questions um, that will determine whether an officer has bias or not. So, uh, Eddie could provide more insight yeah. about what type of evaluations are done, but uh, before uh, officers. Yeah. Are I'll just speak briefly to that. So every officer who goes through the process of getting hired goes through a psychological. Indications that there is something that merits further investigation. They then go on to a um, an interview in person with a psychologist. And I, I will say this, I think. Um, it, I wish there was a filter that would filter all these people. Unfortunately, I think the psych exams, if you're smart enough and you have these biases, uh, you're not going to indicate that on there. So I think um, I wish there was a way that we could definitely filter all these people. But again, sometimes they, they, we catch them. And oftentimes it's during the investigation process where they have conversations with neighbors or prior employees. Uh, and through that, they'll determine that this person has a clear bias that doesn't uh, that makes them unfit for this uh, for this job. Thank you. So, uh, you know, because we're halfway through and we've had a number of people join uh, after the introduction, I just want to run back through and uh, make sure everyone's aware of the the technological issues. Um, you know, uh, as an initial matter, uh, we do have interpretation available, and uh, I would like to give the interpreters a a quick opportunity to uh, identify themselves and, and provide instruction. Um, would, would the Vietnamese interpreter please introduce themselves again? Why don't we move to the Spanish interpreter? Would you please introduce yourself? Uh, yes, my name is Erika Perez, the Spanish interpreter. Um, mi nombre es Erika Perez, soy una de las intérpretes en español. Si usted necesita el audio en español, apague el volumen para este evento importante. Llame al 1-617-675-4444. Y el código de acceso es 728-297-573-1854 con el uh, símbolo del signo. Gracias. Thanks. Thank you. Would the Haitian Creole interpreter please introduce themselves? And my name is Samuel Malis. I'm the Haitian Creole interpreter. No, I'm a minister who interpret for Creole Haitian. And if you want to participate in this, in audio, if you want to produce Creole, and then volume one, in the main event, and then the composition number, 617-675-4444. Again, the number of the phone is 617-675-4444. Lorsque nous composons le numéro ça, on code accès et code accès à c'est 453 179 259 92 11. Code accès encore c'est 453 179 259 92 11 et puis après ça on peut pound qui c'est numéro. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to the Vietnamese interpreter. If you could please introduce yourself. Okay, uh, the uh, Mandarin interpreter, please. Hi, um, uh, so me, Wei, and then Terry will be your Mandarin interpreter. Uh, 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 Thank you. Our Cantonese interpreter, please. Good afternoon, uh, Melissa and Anna will be providing Cantonese interpretation. Hello, Melissa and Anna will be providing Cantonese interpretation. Please press 617-675-4445. Please press 617-675-4445. Please press 617-675-4445. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Cape Verde interpreter, please. Hello, Kelly and Rochelle. I'm your interpreter, Cabo Verdeana. 
Senhor Mestre Áureo, na Criolo, Cabo Verdeano. Então, por favor, chama para 617 675 44 Código de acesso é 548-211-1-10-97-33 e calca naquele botão asterisco no lado direito na teclado numérico e favor desliga o som no evento principal. Obrigado. Thank you. We'll give one more try to the Vietnamese interpreter, please. Okay. Just as a reminder, um, you know, because we do have uh, interpretation services being offered, please try to speak slowly and clearly uh, to enable that to occur. Um, uh, as a reminder, live captioning will be streamed simultaneously as a split screen to this session. On the right hand side of the screen, you will see a window to view the multimedia player which will show the live captioning. Please click continue to view the live captioning. The ASL stream of this meeting can be accessed via Zoom platform. The meeting ID is 964-5353-6839, passcode 151195. The WebEx meeting will be screen shared in the Zoom platform with no audio. Uh, everyone who is joining this event as an attendee will have their microphone muted and you will not have the ability to turn your camera on. If you are joining on a computer device at the bottom device at the bottom of your screen, you have a menu that has different icons. The microphone will be grayed out since you are muted as an attendee. If you can't hear, please click the phone icon and check to make sure your audio connection is set to speaker and microphone. When your name is called to testify, Please raise your hand by clicking the more icon, which is illustrated by three dots, then click the raised hand icon. Once your testimony is done, please click the same icon to lower your hand. Đi này bây giờ chị nói thì chị sẽ mute uh, mute cái cái webex phải không? Please mute your phone. Uh, please press star three if you're on the phone to raise your hand. You will hear two beeps when you are taken off of mute. At that point, you can begin your spoken testimony. Please keep in mind that this meeting is being recorded and testimony will be shared with the task force. We encourage you to continue submitting written comments via the Google form on the boston.gov slash ending dash racism website until August 7th. Um, before we go back to taking testimony, are there any panelists who want to interject? Okay, Faisa, can we call on the next person? Erica Medina is next. Erica, you've been unmuted. Hello, um, I am a, uh, a resident of Dorchester and I am formerly a public defender. Um, so I have some experience of how the policing is happening in Roxbury and Dorchester. Um, and I would just like to um, add to the conversation the fact that even if we are to have implicit bias training for police, the issue is going to be where the accountability comes from, who is deciding whether or not that implicit bias training is working. Um, right now, what's going on is that there is no accountability for the illegal processes that is happening. Uh, there is no accountability for when officers don't turn on their body cams, and even when officers do have their body cameras on. In the videos that we just saw posted by the ACLU, um, of, of, of quote unquote operation clean sweep shows that officers made unconstitutional stops of people um, and there's no accountability for that. The only time anybody ever talks about accountability for officers and, and, and the stops that they make every day in, in our communities um, is when something terrible happens, when there's a stop that ends to somebody's harm or, to, or somebody's death. Um, but the everyday stops that are caused by the implicit bias that exists, not just in the police department, um, but in every system in our society. Those everyday stops, being afraid to walk through your neighborhood um, as a young black person, is, is traumatizing, it's harmful, um, it causes um, irreparable harm that people have to carry with them their whole lives. And so when we're talking about the implicit bias that exists, when we're talking about the training, um, we really have to think about the accountability that goes along with that training, how we're gonna decide, like I said, whether it's working. Um, and 
we have to also consider the fact that um, it's not just the police who are contributing to the, the legal process. It's judges, it's prosecutors, it's, it's, it's criminal defense attorneys, it's everybody involved in the system. And so we have to think about implicit bias at every step không phải chỉ nói về cảnh sát mà họ chịu trách nhiệm về vấn đề thành kiến thành kiến through every step of the process um a reminder that the fios that um the boston police department the stops where they um observe and and interrogate and uh, make a record of the situation are ha happen disproportionately to black people the traffic stops in the city happen disproportionately to black, black people um there was a black reporter who was just fio'd by seven police officers outside of roxbury district court Um, somebody who has been in this community for um, for 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 decades, and so um, it's important to remember those things when we're talking about implicit bias, because again, the harm that we're seeing to the young, especially the young black men in our community, um, is something that they're going to carry with them the rest of their lives. So I hope that this this task force really really takes this the problem of implicit bias very seriously, um, so that we can start to to make some progress in how folks are treated in their own neighborhoods. Thank you, Erica. We we agree with you 100% that uh, accountability is a uh, an essential portion uh, of impacting uh, you know the current issues, and we encourage you to join the uh, public hearing uh, that will be next Wednesday, July 29th, that will deal with the the co-op board, uh, which will get into a number of those issues on accountability and um, you know the uh, public oversight. Uh, when complaints are filed against police for violating uh, these types of rules. Uh, Faiza, can we go to the next uh, individual, please? Angela Mitchell, uh, you have um, But now the fact we reset the old phone so I can send it back that I have. Angela, Smith. if you would like anything. Of course. Ms. Mitchell, we can... You want to offer testimony? No, I wrote it in the in the chat, and I'm going to let that suffice. Thank you very much, though. I'll give others the opportunity. Thank you. Michelle Simos, um, if you would like to verbalize uh, the question that you asked in the chat. Okay, I can't tell if this is on. It's on. Is that okay? Uh, thank you very much for hosting this very important conversation today. I had a couple of questions that were related to um, earlier. Another gentleman was talking about. Uh, the two-hour implicit bias training, et cetera. And I, I happen to be a trainer, not a implicit bias. But what I do know is training, it, very quickly training is forgotten. It has to be reinforced and it has to be applied. So two hours of training, while it's a nice effort, we would call that, and I don't mean to be respectful, but it's more like a check off the box, like we did implicit bias training. It's not really something that has um, stickiness. So I had, so that's one comment. But the other comments are, I feel like we really need to know the hearts of people. What are the hearts of people? And I'm not sure a psychologist, a trained psychologist could even get that in a couple of interviews. And I'm wondering if uh, family and friends are interviewed or whether once uh, an officer is hired, does that person ever receive a 360 evaluation from their peers, the leaders, and perhaps a sampling of residents who they've had interactions with? Because I, I would assume also that the job, it, it, there's a great deal of stress in the job, of course, and there's probably some PTSD involved. And uh, over time, it seems it's really important to check people out from a psychological perspective, uh, but from multiple people. Thanks, Michelle. I just want to provide a clarification that, you know, I think that the two hour reference was from one of the individuals testifying, just saying, uh, you know, two hours is insufficient for, for uh, uh, training. Um, you know, we, we haven't, we have not uh, expressed that the BPD only provides two hours of training. Uh, I, I believe it, it is more extensive than that. But your point is well taken 
that you know uh, prejudice and bigotry are learned behaviors, and anything that's learned can be unlearned, but certainly it, it can't be uh, it can't be unlearned in a in a two hour time period. It requires something more more dedicated and extensive than that. Uh, Isaac, do we have a, another speaker? Kenya, you will be unmuted. Hi everyone. Um, thank you again um, for having um, these sessions for um, such an important conversation. Um, I do want to uh, piggyback off of the comment that the last individual made. Um, understanding that trainings do occur, and even if they're annual, um, they're they're not sufficient. And if we are going to go the route of training. Um, I want to just make the comment for for the um, commission is how will we measure the impactfulness or the success of the training? Meaning, um, how do we know that that it's how do we know that it's working? Um, additionally, um, how are we going to um, find specifically what we need to train? Um, the officers on. I feel like implicit bias is such a broad term, but are we really going to look specifically at data and how are we going to get the data to know how and what we're training individuals on? I, I think you're exactly right, but what data would you say would be important in evaluating whether implicit bias is working? I mean, it, it, it comes down to how, you know, what data can we use? I mean, if, if an officer is, you know, you know, sent to a call, is there reporting that they have to complete? And if there's reporting that they have to complete, are there specific questions that we can ask them within the report that they can answer so that we can identify if there was, if, if the implicit bias training or policy was followed? What about if community members had a mechanism for providing feedback on their interactions with police? Do you, do you think that's something people would actively engage in? I think people would engage in, in that, um, absolutely, but we would have to be careful on, on, on um, one, how we introduce it and, and, and what the questions are. I think especially in this um, climate right now, um, most individuals are not a big fan of police officers. so. Um, and, and individuals at times can be smart enough to kind of answer certain questions so that it, it poses as if the interaction they had with the police officer, the police officer kind of acted, you know, in a, in a manner that, you know, they feel is biased or racist to some degree. So I think we could possibly, um, gather and garner, you know, feedback from um, the community. Um, that would be one way to measure, but I think we really need to look at other ways to measure if the training is really working. Thank you. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. We are going to go back to Jake uh, Liebloff, who was having some mic issues and had his hand raised earlier. Okay, Jake. Jake, you there? Jake. We will go to uh, Stephen Buckley, who had his hand raised earlier. Yes, thank you again. I was just making a technical comment before and not on the subject at hand. Um, before today's meeting, I was checking to see what kind of implicit bias training there was that the Boston police was using. And I couldn't, I Googled it, but all I could find was that news stories saying they were getting it, not what kind or if it was being measured. Um, I agreed with the idea that uh, if there's some measuring stick, um, to be able to test for whether it's working or not, then certainly um, that would be a way to figure out, you know, but if, if, if you don't know what the goal is that you have in mind, then any road will do. And uh, if you go to Wikipedia, that was one of the hits I got, 
um, there is something called, that's commonly used, called the implicit association test. And what's happened, some people take it before the training, and then they take the training, and then they take it after the training. And you find out if, you know, if there was any difference. And so that's what I would suggest is that the uh, task force figure out um, what end goal it wants to have, what it's shooting for, and how to measure progress on how to get there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephen. Daisy, do we have any other raised hands? Dina is the next participant. Dina, you are unmuted. Hi, um, I just had a, um, a quick comment. I just wanted to um, also say one way I'm thinking that we could um, probably measure it is by, I mean, by the body cams. I feel like if the officers are wearing the body cams, that's one way to see, um, you know, while they're on duty, if there's, you know, any type of bias um, that's expressed, you know, during traffic stops or any arrest or, you know, anything that may occur. And um, also, just to see, um, you know, other officers, um, if they're working, you know, together, that that's one way that they could be held accountable as well. So if an officer does see another officer that's showing any type of bias, um, maybe he could also be held responsible to see, you know, if he reports that or, you know, even approaches the officer. Um, and, you know, and, you know, just mentions to him that, you know, that wasn't right or that, you know, you're showing bias and so forth. So I feel like also, um, you know, that could be done as well. Thank you. I appreciate that, Dina. I should point out that the, the BPD has adopted the uh, eight can't wait. And, and one of them is a, a duty to intervene. Uh, and to identify officers who are engaging in uh, unlawful behavior, which, um, you know, should include, uh, you know, uh, policing with, uh, in, in a bigoted way. Uh, Faisa, do we have any other hands up? So, Aaron Davies, uh, it looks like Aaron has another uh, comment. Okay. Yes, thank you. And I, I will try to be brief. Um, I, I really like that folks are talking about the accountability part of this and the, the you know, uh, testing to see if it's going to take. One other thing I was thinking about is to have training be most effective. You really want people who are, who really buy into it and want it. I don't know if officers are really asking for it or if leadership's really asking for it, but something to think about is to engage if possible, some of the officers in the review of the training, the development of the training, maybe even teach them as coaches, people who are particularly open to the concepts of personal mastery and learning about these things. Just a thought is to engage some of them in the development of the program so it isn't just something uh, hoisted upon them, but something that they're actually a part of. Just a thought. Thank you, Aaron. So I see that um, you know Jake asked a question, and Jake's having microphone issues. Um, Jake asked, "Who would lead the training? Would the BPD seek out critical voices and allow them to be part of the conversation?" Um, so Jake, that that you know hits on one of the issues that that will be a, a consideration of the task force in making our recommendations to the mayor. Um, you know, and one of the things that, that we've been focused on is looking externally and trying to identify voices uh, who have expertise in this particular area, who have a, a track record of successfully providing training, specifically within police departments, although more broadly in, in a corporate context as well, and then trying to examine what other police departments across the country have done, uh, you know, successfully and, and unsuccessfully, uh, but uh, to to track the effectiveness of the trainings that they're implementing, and and you know specifically we want to identify those who have had success, uh, who have the data to back up that success, 
and, and we want to use them as a, as a guide for, for what Boston can implement. Do we have uh, any other hands raised? No other raised hands at the time. Okay. Want to remind everyone? User you know, six. I'm, is user six hand not raised? Oh, did they already speak and forgot to put it down? So user six, I believe that was the first question, uh, first comment that we took testimony on, um, and some folks have not lowered their hand. But we can try unmuting to see if there's additional okay. testimony. Okay. Caller, you are unmuted if you would like to provide additional testimony. Oh, I'm sorry. That was me that um, I didn't know about the press the button. I thought you guys did it for me. But since I'm on here, um, I know that he felt like my question may have been a little bit uh, away from the bias. But one of the callers made a comment about the heart of the matter, and that was pertaining to why I asked the question about um, the officers um, adhering to the oath and things like that, because everything is done from a heart matter perspective when you're uh, judging people uh, in calls or uh, whatever they're doing on, on duty. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Tasha. All right, I want to remind everyone, please, this is, this is your opportunity to provide input to provide guidance, um, you know, to, uh, to help inform our recommendations to Mayor Walsh on what changes can be made in, in areas of implicit bias and implicit bias training. We certainly want to hear your thoughts and hear your experiences. So, so please, um, you know, use the, uh, the icon to, to, to raise your hand. And if you're on the phone, uh, use star three to raise your hand and, and you know, take this opportunity to provide feedback. While we're waiting for people to raise their hand, are there any panelists who, um, you know, want to interject at this point? So just real briefly, I know somebody stepped in earlier and talked about the idea of educating the public in terms of their biases. Um, I understand what this conversation is about, and absolutely, we need to do a better job of uh, digging in and really getting to the surface and trying to find out what officers' biases are. I think it's also important that we educate the public in terms of how uh, officers uh, do their job when they find that they've done something wrong that they reported, but also uh, let them know that they have to be mindful about um, how they interact with officers. So just wanted to say that. Brenda James, uh, you have been unmuted. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Brenda. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm a former Boston police officer and I had a, um, <clears throat> a really bad experience with a superior officer. And so, um, I'm not going to get so much into the story, but I came from a community policing background. I thought it was very effective. Um, I don't believe that implicit uh, training is the only thing we should be looking at. So I guess I'm wondering how are you going to determine where people are at with their biases? I mean, just we're assuming that, you know, everyone's on a certain level when you begin the training. Um, and from the experience that I've had that has affected me now almost 10 years, um, that person was not held accountable to what happened with me. Um, I've been suffering for 10 years now, and I think this person will never really understand what he's done to my life. And so we're talking about one accountability, but where, you know, from, from ground zero, when you go in with the officers, how do you d distinguish, like, who has the biases? Um, do you just assume that everyone doesn't have them and that you're going to train all of them the same way? I think that's very important. So if I understand, Brenda, you're asking about how will I, how will they identify the level of bias Correct. in individual police officers? Yes, sir. 
And so, you know, based upon on your experience, you know, what do you think could be done to reduce bias within the BPD? Well, I think the implicit training, I think the, the, the training should include scenarios, real life scenarios. I think that you should get some input from the community about their own personal experiences. Um, to let the scenarios be, you know, as close to real life as possible. But I, but I am wondering um, how you're going to establish who currently has biases and who's had bad experiences on the job, or just every, is everyone's slate just clean? Because I think again, one of the one of the things that I want to point out, I think that if we, you know, looked into the prior records of some of the officers that were involved in um, some of this the bad actors, if you will, if we looked into their records, we'll see that they've had repeat offenses and, and no one ever um, looked into that. So is that, it, where are you guys going to be at in terms of looking at um, the level of bias that officers have going into this? Well, so, I mean, Brenda, I think, you know, you've identified two really important points, which is, is one, you know, what we've talked about today, uh, what we've talked about today is primarily looking at implicit bias in terms yes. of the impact upon policing and in, in interactions with community members. And I think what you've hit upon is there's there's those implicit biases also play out within the police force itself and, and right. the way that, you know, individual, you know, people of color are treated within the police force. And of Correct. course, the effect that, that those biases might have in that context is to decrease uh, the uh, uh, amount of diversity within the police force, which of course just you know uh, perpetuates the the external issues and and leads to kind of a vicious cycle. So Correct. of course you know that implicit bias training is is intent whether it's implicit bias training, anti-racist training, um, you know the the intent is obviously to have an impact internally and externally. But then I think you're also hitting on. Um, you know, a uh, cultural issue that yes. is similarly perpetuated by a lack of diversity within the organization. And so I think that an important way to address that is, is via increasing diversity within the BPD and then, you know, increasing the, uh, part, the representation of people of diversity within the more senior levels of the BPD. Well, can I interject for one moment, though? Um, and, and, and pardon me if I'm not hitting all the points, because I'm very emotionally attached to this. I'm still trying to get some sort of resolve to a 10-year issue. Um, my record has always been impeccable. I did community service work. I was a juvenile officer. I interacted with mentally ill people. I was in the schools. Um, when I got a radio call for a, a child who was delinquent, I would always look to see if that child was reading on the appropriate grade level. I wanted to know what their support system was like. Um, I, I hosted a workshop for a, a housing development with a community center, and we talked about medication. So these are all the things that I did that were very important. But what I'm saying is that I think community policing works. I think that should still be a part of implicit bias um, training. Um, but I want to know how do you determine, you know, it's almost like a, it, this is supposed to fix the problem, so to speak. It's supposed to make people aware of how they should behave. And that's obviously we talked about this. Is, these are learned behaviors that you can't necessarily fix. How do you determine some of the bad actors even going into it? <laughs> I don't know if I've made my question clear because again, this is very, this is a very visceral experience for me based on what I've gone through. So I think so, you're saying more that you, your your suggestion is that you feel that more needs to be done uh, to identify people with biases and prejudices at correct. the time that they're entering the police station. That's absolutely correct. Okay, understood. Uh, Brenda, do you have any recommendations on how that could be done? Well, I think I think a lot of things have already been um, documented, recorded. I think that the disciplinary records are um, 
I think they're pretty well up to date. I mean, I, I think people need to do some research and figure out, go through personnel files, it's, you know, they go back through the same process they did when they did hiring. And I think diversity is a great idea, but you, you'll never really reach that quota or you'll never really reach that goal until you learn to, until the system changes and you can retain the good officers that you have. You know, again, I, I'm out of a career right now um, with no suspensions on my record, no citizens tabs. And I did a lot of work in the community that I'm very proud of. And it's rare that a police officer loses their job and there's no resolve. It's been 10 years. So I'm saying that to say the system is, is very, very broken. And we have to start looking at everything holistically where the bad actors are, you can go through the implicit training and still, if the, if it's ingrained in some of these officers, how do you, again, I, and I'm sure everyone has touched on this, how do you measure the success of the training? But I think you have to know where you're starting before you can determine where you're going. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, you know, we appreciate you sharing your experience and, and your testimony today. Jason, do we have anyone else with their hand up? <clears throat> Any other raised hands? No raised hands at the moment. Okay. Pardon me, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, so I just want to say as a task force member that I think that stories like Brenda and others, as we come on these uh, individual topics, that there are going to be those folks who are uh, affected directly. They are, are victims in some way or the other of, of what we're talking about. So just as I want uh, people, when we're talking about excessive force, people involved who have been victims of that, I think that folks like Brenda providing their testimony in, through these listening sessions, uh, that's one thing. But when we do further deliberation at the end, I think that some some people we're going to have to pull back for further uh, consideration. I agree. Faisa, can we call Angela Williams? She's um, posted a few comments. I think I think it would be great to hear from her. And Angela is a past president of, of Mamlio as well, um, you know, and, and once again, so all, this is what I mean. Uh, part of this, we're collecting testimonies for those who want to say it on, you know, audio or what have you, but I don't want anybody to think that their story is getting missed uh, just by this. And, and many of these stories are going to elicit us having to revisit. Well, you are here in case you want to verbalize task force. Good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm. I am a retired Boston police officer. Um, my first, after the academy, my first 30 days on the job, my training officer greeted me with language that I had never expected. He said to me, women and niggers don't belong on the job. Um, I was taken back, but I dealt with it. And I was forced to deal with it because I went to three supervisors, a Hispanic female supervisor and two African-American supervisors, sergeants and lieutenants. And they all told me the same thing. You have a long career pick your battles. None of them gave me any guidance on how to respond to this individual. I always look back on this and thank my grandmother for giving me the fortitude to be a strong individual. I am foreign born. I am Hispanic black female. And um, it just gave me the strength to be able to stand up to him for those 30 days because he challenged me all throughout, threatening me. Um, well, you know, I'm your training officer and 
what I, my, my um, evaluation um, depends on whether you stay on the job or not. And again, I thank God for my grandmother because I was able to say, yeah, well, okay, I've got, I got good command of the English language as well. You know, so it's on. Um, the department is, it has a history of, if you are not white, you are not right. Um, we have a lot of good officers at the job. I don't ever want to broad stroke all the officers in the same basket because they're good officers in the job, but there's some freaking rotten ones. And they make it difficult for those who are good. And the department needs to get rid of the good old boy system and deal with the issues at hand. How do you treat another human being with such contempt and not suffer any consequences? And you, 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 you some officers on the job have the, the notion that, you know, they are entitled. The mere fact that this officer could say to me, niggas and women don't belong on the job, he had a sense of entitlement. He knew that he would suffer absolutely no repercussion for making that statement because nobody would hear me. That was a rude awakening. To Brenda's point, I too left the job without with, with a clean record. But I ended up being forced off because of an incident that took place. It is what it is in life. But I implore, training is not the answer. I've gone to the academy. And if officers attending in-service training don't agree with the training that's there, depending on who the instructor is, may get heckled. The, the, the material is left on the desk, if not blatantly thrown in the trash, you know? So training is not the, the, the total, the begin and end all answer. There needs to be more than training. You actually need to get involved in the, with the community, members in the community. Once we begin to build relationship, a lot of those barriers break down naturally, but it's, start, it's a starting point. And the point about educating the community, that too is necessary because the black community is suffering 400 years of historic disparity. So this is not something that's gonna happen overnight because training is developed this is a systemic problem that needs addressing from the root this is not a band-aid what happened to george floyd on national tv should have never flipping happened this is a human being against another human being <sighs> we need more than training it, I, I don't have the answers because if I did, I would be sitting pretty. But it needs more than training. We really have to get to the root of the problem. That's it. Thank you, Angela. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Yep, Marie, you're breaking up a little bit. So, in, I know that you were on the force for many years. And so, if you help us. Marie, you're breaking up a little bit. Angela, are you still there? I am. So, you know, Angela, based upon your experience, 
you know, what do you think are the important steps that can be taken to start addressing and identifying, you know, uh, individuals within the BPD who exhibit racist behavior or bigotry? I would start definitely with accountability. As an officer, if I know that if I act out of character, I am going to be held accountable, it, it, I think twice. I worked in Roxbury for many years, and I saw how my fellow officers dealt with the public. I got transferred to West Roxbury, and some of those very same officers that were in Roxbury dealt with West, West Roxbury residents totally different because they knew they were held at the highest standard. They knew they could not speak or act or say certain things out of the side of their neck to um, the resident of West Roxbury as they could in Roxbury. And that's because in West Roxbury, they will be held accountable. In Roxbury, our voices fall on deaf ears. So it needs to be accountability first and foremost. In the training, training happens, you treat residents in community A the very same way you treat the residents in community B. And residents have to feel empowered. And granted, again, there is a history of a separation of, of discontent between law enforcement and community. But through active participation, through building relationship, that too can, can, can be quelched. But the way things are now, us against them, that's not that that's not a remedy that that's making things worse we we need to the department period needs to first and foremost foremost get rid of this color blue you know where you are expected to be silent i also had an incident where these officers beat this 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 suspect up at the end of the day, they wrote the report, excluding me from the report. When the suspect went to court, the suspect told the story. There was a female officer handcuffing me. They pushed her out of the way. They threw me in the ground. They beat me up. When the judge asked, where is this officer? Why isn't this officer mentioned in the report? The three officers came to me and literally threatened me that if I did not get on the stand and support them, what my life would be like working last half on B2. You know, they, they went on to say, well, I'm not saying we won't go to your call when you're getting beat up, but we may take the scenic route. That's the crap that we have to put up with. You know, and these are supposed to be my fellow officers. So folks need to be at the bar, at the end of the day, be held accountable for their behavior. And you can have all the training you want. If the department is not going to hold officers accountable, you're wasting your time. Marie, uh, are you back? Do you have a, a question you want to ask? Hi, dear. This is Tanisha. If Maria is still trying to connect, I, I would like to weigh in. Sure, please. A good afternoon. Uh, first, Angela, thank you uh, for sharing your story um, and getting it in the record. Um, it's important uh, that we that we hear it. It's important that we heard it in full. Um, you know, and it, and it reminds me as I was listening to uh, one of the earlier, um, and I do apologize, I don't remember her name, uh, women who called in um, and was asking the question about the oath of office um, that BPD okay. members take. I actually, and I, I hear you on the accountability piece, and I think it's important um certainly for us as task force members to to have a conversation and 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 we will um about that oath uh because there are commitments that members of law enforcement make not only to uphold the constitution which includes um certainly equal protection uh certainly um you know uh it, there, there's also a reference in in the oath with respect to an expectation of executing 
uh, responsibilities with impartiality, that all ties into this conversation. And so I could not agree with you more. There's, there's training, certainly, but training absent accountability for actually, um, you know, operating in accordance with that training uh, is, is really, um, it, it's worthless in my opinion. Uh, so I could not agree with you more as it relates to accountability and, um, you know, who knows where um, we're going to land as a task force, but I can assure you that we will have a robust conversation about what accountability uh, should look like going forward. Thank you so much, Angela. It, it, you're incredibly brave uh, to share your experience with us and we really appreciate it. We also have uh, Brenda who has her hand raised. So I'm going to uh, unmute you, Brenda, uh, as we wait on Rep. St. Fleur. It's just me again. I, I really wanted to openly thank Angela for being so explicit and brave and telling her story because these are the kind of experiences that we go through. It's damaging, it's traumatizing. It affects our family members. Um, as I was doing the community policing, I think the acrimonious relationship started with officers that didn't really believe in community policing. They didn't believe that it was something that should really be implemented. I was asked to change reports often. Um, I had supervisors that were targeting certain areas um, and I was expected to have a dual role, which would have put my life in danger. Um, it then spilled over into the neighborhood where I lived. And I was presumed to be too close to the people that I lived with. They were my neighbors. There was a shooting in my area. And uh, unbeknownst to me, I guess a search warrant was needed to do the type of investigatory work that they were doing. But I got pulled into the crime scene. I got pulled into the crime scene with my life being put in danger because I didn't know who was out in, out in the crowd. I don't know who was watching. But because I was trying to help and I was trying to calm down some of the kids that were, you know, upset and emotional, maybe even traumatized, I was trying to help them and they pulled me into the crime scene. And after they pulled me into the crime scene, the supervisor started yelling at me. Again, the sense of entitlement that he could speak to me a certain way. And again, it was two o'clock in the morning. My daughter was sleeping and he ordered me to go to my unit. Um, and so nothing that I understood came from that. No one called me. No one asked me any questions about the person that got shot. Um, but I would say maybe a year later, I had an indelible mark on my back without understanding it. And I got pulled over. I didn't pulled over. A cruiser came behind my car in the South End and she started swearing at me. That escalated to two officers surrounding me to arrest me on the corner of uh, Yama Street and Columbus Ave. And my daughter was on the phone. My daughter heard the entire thing. She was traumatized by it. And they tried to arrest me, but they did detain me for over an hour. And what came from that was a supervisor tried to get me fired in 2002. In 2002, that supervisor told me that he would never stop coming for me. He called the supervisor that wrangled my loaded firearm on June 8th at one o'clock in the morning. He's still being protected. He's going to retire with probably over 200,000 a year. I had to drive just to get internet to, to, to be participating in this. We've got to get rid of the good old boy system. So if you're training people that don't care about the training, that are not going to change their mindset, their behaviors, they know that they're not going to be accountable, it won't stop. It won't stop. I am destitute. I've been fighting for 10 years. For 10 years. My parents were together for a long time. They were, my mom, God rest her soul, she must be turning over in her grave. I had dreams of my own. I went to Boston Latin. I, I worked really hard. I became a police officer 
and I decided that I was going to really do what I could to help the community. I did a detail once at Whole Foods in the South End. And the manager told me to go and lock two kids up that had lobsters in their butt basket. And I said to her politely, I have to treat them the way they deserve to be treated. And they haven't committed a crime. And she hounded me and she hounded me. And she said, I'm going to call the district station to make sure you never get this detail again. But I made the decision again to do what was right. So I politely pulled the two gentlemen over, the two boys over, and I just asked them if they were okay, if they were going shopping for a relative, and they said they were going shopping for their grandmother, and they had the money in their hand. And she was irate. She was irate that I was right, and she was wrong, and this didn't play out the way she wanted to play out. I don't know what the answers are. How do you deal with bigotry and hatred and, and systemic racism? How do you deal with it? My case has been bounced around in the court system. The captain is just, he testified at least three or four times and admitted to what he did. He admitted to it. And I'm still being called a liar. The lieutenant who witnessed the incident, he corroborates my story. Why am I in this situation? My family's affected by it. I'm affected by it. I haven't slept in two days. No one should have to go through this. Implicit training, bias training sounds great. It sounds like we're checking off the box. But how do you weed out the bad apples now? How do you do that now? This man had a vendetta from 2002. He called my supervisor when I was out injured. I got carried AWOL one month prior to being cleared. And I got cleared. He took my wages. That's a state claim. I didn't file the state claim. I came to work. I kept my head down. And my family said, don't even complain about the money that he took. He tampered with payroll, but don't pick and choose your battles. So I did. I worked the midnight shift. I kept my head down. I got a gun off the street. My injury was from chasing after three suspects, which we apprehended. And I tore my ACL. So after all the rehabilitation that I went through, Brenda, the legitimate Brenda, injury. Brenda, I, um, I just, I want to, we're supposed to limit testimony to two minutes. I want to be respectful to other people who, who sure. have something to say before we finish at five o'clock. So, okay. um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I do want to say, I, I don't want to cut you off because, you know, what you're providing is, is incredibly important testimony. And of course, we, we all appreciate, uh, you know, you being brave enough to speak out and, and share your experience. They and, can't ruin uh, lives. Lives can't be ruined from this. I, I agree, Brenda. And, and you know, I, I do want to point out in, implicit bias training is, of course, only one part uh, of, of many components that, that we are examining. And, you know, it, it, it takes uh, a change of the whole system to, to have any, any impact. So why I agree, implicit bias training, uh, revising it or, or swapping it out for some other system isn't enough. You know, uh, hopefully that in conjunction with other change will be enough to to uh, to foster some sort of improvement. So, thank you, Brenda. Um, Beza, can we call on the next person, please? Um, Cassie, we will unmute you next. Cassie, we only have a few minutes left, so. Please try to keep your testimony as, as brief as possible. Well, I would have done that in the first place, except that I didn't know and I was the first person. And Cassie, Cassie you got oh. a very we have a limited time. Please. Maybe so, but I feel a little bit insulted or whatever. I've had a hard time on this meeting. Uh, I'm sorry. Well, speak. I was, the piece that I, would, I, I only wanted to add is that there's a bias that goes in police in terms of assuming they're only dealing with the suspect um, and that that's the only important point. They broke the law, this is the punishment, this is me and this is them. Whereas there's a whole bias that comes, and I, I, was it Brenda was the other person who said about, you know, they, they don't like community policing, which sort of means that you have to be able to listen to the people around the person, the resources, the other people speaking. You know, the bystander watching George Floyd, he, he was giving information. Look, you, you know, uh, and not only that, but having the peace people, the peace training people or whatever, 
also work with get to know not only the suspects directly, but also their families or whatever, you got family therapy. There's a whole other piece of community that is active in African-American culture that is just so important, but we don't think about that when we're just dealing with you broke the law. Uh, anyway, we're, we're too regimented and too regiment, uh, fragmented. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. And could I ask Angela and Brenda and any other former police officers who have had negative experiences who may not have had an opportunity to share to Please provide email or contact info in, in the chat so that we have it on record and we have a, a way to contact you. Uh, Faisa, can we go to the next individual, please? Dina, you will be unmuted. I have a quick question. I just wanted to know what is the process as far as um, performance evaluation? Um, for police officers, I know for most jobs, you know, when you're hired, there's a 90 day, you know, probation period where you're monitored and, you know, reviewed. And if you pass that, then you can continue. And then also you usually have, you know, an annual review where they review your performance, you know, and everything that's on the job. So I guess I'm just not familiar with um, what is a performance evaluation for police officers and what actually um is entailed in that like it's bias one of the things that they you know that they measure or any type of you know complaints or you know anything like that thank you dina we will post an answer to your question on the task force website okay thank you. do we have one more uh faza miss x you will be unmuted. Ma'am, thank you, sir. I just want to say, Angela and Brenda, thank you so much for your experiences. I too uh, was a female officer. However, I was in the military. I was a military police officer. Uh, so we operated on our scale. But this again shows us that um, this has to take place inside and outside. It requires us to develop ability if our culture perspectives and bridge cultural commonalities and differences with our community. This is not, um, this training is not about internal problems that are deep seat rooted and is part of the PPD culture. I mean, and, and, and I, I it, it cringe to know that they went through that, but you know, I too as a female, a minority, I've been through a few things myself. However, you know, I feel that this is a good step, but it has to be something different from the prior implicit bias that training that officers have. Accountability is a huge piece of that. And, you know, going back and check, checking, and I, I sent you, um, Javi, a um, implicit bias um, test that we would give, I gave, because I did uh, teach certain classes to educators, law enforcement officers, as well as military uh, personnel on cultural competency. So. Just thank you for hearing my piece. Um, I will for the BPD as I do every night. And female officers, thank you for being so brave. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you very much. So with that, it's now 501. Um, so I wanna thank you all again for your participation today and for engaging in this discussion with us. Uh, community participation is a key component to this work. As a reminder, there are four total listening sessions. Uh, body cameras was yesterday. Uh, next Wednesday and Thursday, we will have the co-op police review board session. And on Thursday, we will have the use of uh, a hearing on the use of force policies. Please continue to participate and submit your written comments in any language until August 7th, using the link posted on the screen and on the website. Um, as I said, two remaining next week, Wednesday, July 29th from 3 to 5, and then Thursday, July 30th from 3 to 5. Thank you again.